4.45, time to start. <clears throat> Hello everyone, thanks for coming to this last session for today. It was a long day, too much information. <laughs> I understand you. Uh, I hope you still have some energy for me, some space to learn something. And uh, this session about data virtualization using SQL Server Big Data Cluster. And first of all, please silence your cell phones. Uh, I already done for mine. And <clears throat> uh, PASS provide a lot of opportunities to learn or end networking. Yeah, PASS Summit it's a uh, big conference but there are many virtual or on-site places and events where you can meet people, learn a lot of information free. Yeah, like SQL Saturday, it's full day trainings, completely free. And it is really good opportunity to find uh, new friends uh, or answer on your questions about SQL Server or any data platform solutions. Yeah, connect uh, to virtual groups, uh, virtual chapters, marathon, specialize it on specific area in data platform. It's really helpful if you can just visit on site event, you can uh, meet your uh, favorite speakers, favorite authors online and uh, ask questions. My name is Sergey Lunyakin. I'm a big data architect at software company. And software uh, company <laughs> I'm working for, it's not ice cream. If you heard about ice cream <laughs> software, this is not about ice cream. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, 25 years ago in Ukraine, it's Ukrainian company and I'm originally from Ukraine. Uh, 25 years ago, nobody knows <laughs> that uh, Soft or it's ice cream, right? <laughs> That's why it's like software development. <laughs> yeah, uh, we do like consulting and I work for big data analytics team in our center of excellence. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, many things, <laughs> like starting with meeting with customers, understand problems, yeah, issues and challenges and try to combine all available technologies to solve this specific <coughs> business uh, challenge. Yeah, uh, so I am focused on, on not only on Microsoft, but on Google and AWS technologies, but Microsoft is my first and main technology stack. I am Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and uh, I have some many certifications uh, in Google, Microsoft, and AWS. Yeah, and uh, I use it to run a uh, user group, local chapter, past local chapter in Ukraine, Lviv, where, uh, west part of Ukraine, yeah, <clears throat> before I moved to US. So seven months ago, I moved to Seattle area, now I'm here. <laughs> and other guys now are running this group and organize SQL Saturday. Yeah. Um, this is my contacts on the left bottom side, the corner. Please don't hesitate to contact me after this session if you have any questions about this topic or any like, data platform, big data from Microsoft or like, compare. I like to work with different technology stack. It allows me to compare different technologies, different vendors, and it's really useful when you need to solve some challenge for customer, but it's not enough to use only one technology stack or only one solution, right? Uh, before I start, uh, I know there are at least three session um, past summit that connected with data virtualization and two of them with uh, SQL Server and Big Data Cluster. One about big data cluster was uh, yesterday, Ben Weissman, 
yeah, delivered it, and today morning JRJ delivered it about data virtualization in SQL Server. Uh, <laughs> and I would like to know who has been on this session. Yeah, <laughs> this part. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I am maybe who already uh, tried to do something with big data cluster and yeah, SQL Server. 2019, Polybase, experience with Polybase SQL. No. Okay, we have some guys. Um, any data visualization platform, I know, Dinodo, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And we, we have, or it was, or be tomorrow, Dinodo session about data visualization. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, it's good. Uh, and. I'd like to ask you about your uh, role, like data engineer, okay, data scientist, managers, analysts. Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, it's good. So uh, my topics for today is uh, about data virtualization. Why do we need this? Uh, what kind of problem we're going to solve? using data virtualization and use cases because it's not for solving all problems or challenges that we have uh, when we have many different systems and distributed data sources. We will talk about SQL Decade Big Data Cluster, how it looks like and uh, <coughs> what data virtualization does in Big Data Cluster. And at the end, I will show demos and after, at the end, I will tell you about some lesson learned during some projects with data visualization, not with uh, like big data cluster, like big data cluster as well, but big data cluster is not GA. In GA, bless you, uh, not in GA, that's why I, I don't have real production experience. Uh, I, I did some POCs for customers, uh, but I had like production experience with Dinodo and some other data visualization tools. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry for my voice. I, I had like uh, sick a couple days ago and I'm still recovering. <coughs> okay, why data visualization? Yeah, uh, like data visualization, it tells itself that it virtualizes some abstract, some complexity, right? Uh, it's usually in company we don't have one data source, we don't have one data warehouse or <clears throat> one type of data source, like relational database, non-relational files, flat files, yeah, websites. And that's why we have like different data sources underneath and the simple, like simple diagram, right? We try to abstract all this complexity, all these data sources for our customers for our consumers, like top managers, data analysts, data scientists, yeah, try to simplify access to those data sources, right? And we try to simplify data access, we try to improve control and access to those data sources and speed up our uh, development, yeah, from development to production, like to have short time because time is money, right? Uh, and what are like usual challenges with many data sources? We have like, there are many, right? <laughs> First of all, and there are complex access rules. Like if I need access to this business system, I have to create IT ticket to support. Uh, like this ticket should be approved by many levels of managers and after that I will maybe I will have access to some data sources and I can try to look to these data sources, discovery, find could I use it to solve my business problem, answer on my business questions and this is like long time, yeah, weeks, months. Uh, we don't have central access point. Yeah, if even I have access to my data sources, I, I, I need different connection strings, different credentials to access. And uh, for IT, 
for security team, it's hard to monitor access to all those data sources from different places. And uh, like considering GDPR uh, or FIPS, uh, we need to control and audit this access. Uh, when we have distributed system in different locations and we control access on different locations, it's hard to, to do. And uh, time to market, right? Uh, as I mentioned, yeah, it takes a lot of time to access this data, to get access, connect, and play with data, and discover this data. But we need answer here and now to run our business. Yeah? That's why time to market is really important, and data visualization helps you to solve this challenge. Yeah. <clears throat> Minimize uh, time from accessing data to get some value from data and answer business questions, get benefits. Cell service analysis. Yeah, cell service anywhere. Right, we have cell service BI, cell service ETL. Like data visualization allows us to spread cell service among our company. Yeah, it simplifies cell service BI. Any questions? Use cases. It's really important for data virtualization to understand when and why we can use data virtualization. Because uh, usually vendors, they try to cover a lot of case, use cases and replace some uh, existing system with data virtualization. It's, some of them are it's not appropriate. So uh, three main like directions is data virtualization, ETL or ELT, and enterprise service bus. Yeah, this is when we use access data, move data, connect data. Yeah. And if we talk about moving data from a data source to some analytic system, so and run some uh, no, queries, complex queries, it's not about data virtualization because we uh, it's better to use ETL, yeah, because ETL it's more appropriate and scalable system to ingest data from sources to destinations. Data virtualization supplies a lot of complex, uh, try to optimize queries and connections that can uh, like increase uh, workload on our source systems. Yeah, that is inappropriate because it's critical business system. We can we should have like better performance than on our data warehouse. Uh, best priority. Like real-time insights, when we need data now without waiting when we move this data data warehouse and we start analysis. Yes, yeah, for sales, marketing, uh, for uh, our uh, sensors, right? For security, we'd like to have numbers now here, data utilization helps us because we have direct access to our data source. Yeah, we have fresh data any second, right? Yeah. Is it possible to use real time insights using data visualization without any ETL? Aren't you sort of heavy cleaning to the production environment? I will, yeah, the question was that if we move do you mean ETL move to replace? We are going to use into ETL. Like here I mentioned like, yes, ETL is better to use for data movement. Data utilization we don't use for data movement, right? <clears throat> but we, it's appropriate to use data utilization for real time insights for some, because we, real time insights, we have some fresh data, some increment. It's not like big amount of data that we move from source. But we will talk about uh, like how we can improve performance for data virtualization. Yeah, what data virtualization platform used to improve performance and what we should consider when we use it. <clears throat> uh, virtual data mart and data warehouses. Yeah, we can create some virtuals, especially as JRJ mentioned, when you have many data warehouses, you would like to use one like data mart 
that contains different tables from different data warehouses. Yeah, we can use virtual data mart and data visualization is a good solution to build it very quick. Physical data marts, yeah, it's physical data marts, we can't use data utilization, we have to use ETL to build our data warehouse, data marts on physical database and move data inside. And this is because also we, we need to use for analysis historical data. Yeah, but in data utilization, we connect to our data source that doesn't store historical data. That's why we, need, we still need to use data warehouse, data marts, and ETL to move data to data warehouse to analyze like entire data set for whole history of our companies. <coughs> synchronize applications. Yeah, when we move data synchronized between two different applications, they share some common information we need to use or ETL or enterprise service bias. Yeah, some messaging system that's more appropriate for small chunks of data and synchronize it, them. Uh, data discovery and enrichment. Yeah, when data scientists or data analysts, they would like to discover our data source, they don't know what it is in this data source, how data looks like and how we can transform what better transform transformation levels we need to apply. That's why data virtualization is better because we can easily access this data, discover data structures, data itself, and try to figure out how we can connect different data sources, how we can clean this data, what kind of clean operations we can apply. And this is for data scientists, for data analysts but not for top managers or managers who just would like to see some analytics numbers. But data scientists, they always would like to use fresh data from many data sources. They would like to discover this data, discover some value. So serverless analysis in POC, yeah, it's time to market. It's speed up our POC because we don't have to create new connections and uh, create access credentials, we already have this data, we can play with it. Uh, <clears throat> Event-driven workflow, again, this is real-time, more solutions and more integration solutions. Integrate different system using event-driven approach. This is for ESB. And customer 360, yeah, because we have all data sources in one place and one entry point for them, like, uh, ODBC or REST API, we can use data virtualization to look to all data in all our systems and know about our customers everything. Yeah, these appropriate solutions. And when you, this one lesson that you should remember that use cases, it's really important. You can't just start using data virtualization, at, not only for data virtualization, but any any solution, any uh, tool that you use. This tool was built for some cases, not for all cases. That's why you should, first of all, you should identify all use cases for your company, for your, how you are going to approach this challenge in your company, what cases, and then start to look functionality, what um, tools, solutions available on the market. And here we have like serial, SQL Server Big Data Cluster. Yeah, uh, some of you already know about this architecture. Yeah, this is uh, like SQL Server plus Hadoop plus Spark, and we run it on Kubernetes. And because we run it on Kubernetes, we can run it in the cloud. We can run it on premises. And from my experience, it's really important because. If we use only cloud, but I, we have many customers who stick with on-premises. There's banks, financial big co uh, customers, they prefer to use on-prem, uh, but we can't install cloud, like scalable solutions to on-prem. And we have to mix different solutions, like install SQL Server, install Cloudera or Hortonworks try to integrate each other, try to install another NoSQL database and 
uh, like notebook server and try to all this integrate. It's very complex. Azure SQL Big Data Cluster already provide everything and it's integrated, which is oh, each other, right? We need to just install our Kubernetes cluster and deploy our Big Data Cluster, SQL Server Big Data Cluster. Yeah. And uh, architecture, like high level architecture, we have control <coughs> layer, like where we manage our Kubernetes cluster. We have controller node, and controller node uh, we use for manage our big data cluster components. And we have shared services responsible for security, for monitoring, logging, audit, right? all these common things for our pieces. Uh, big data cluster itself has several layers, yeah. And this is SQL Server Master. This is our traditional SQL Server on Linux, yeah. Where we can create our databases, we can keep our OLTP databases in master. We can use machine learning services in SQL Server Master node, yeah. So this is our SQL Server. And we access all our components from this node. Yeah. We just connect to SQL Server using uh, SSMS or Azure Data Studio or any tool apl applicable for SQL Server. And we can access our Hadoop cluster. We can access our SQL uh, MPP cluster distributed and work with all data available in our company, like relational, non-relational, right, from one place. We have compute pool. Compute pool, it's our compute resources for uh, our MPP cluster, right? It's our dedicated compute nodes for data aggregation, data processing. When we <clears throat> talk about processing HDFS data or our relational MPP data storage. And SQL data pools is our MPP storage, where we distribute our relational data and store in different nodes and process it using compute pool. Storage pool, it's our data lake. It's HDFS with Spark and SQL Server. Yeah, and where we store our data, non-relational or relational in files, and we can create our external tables that we're, we look on it. In the application pool, we can install any web applications uh, that use our data in our cluster, right? So it's like one bullet, silver bullet, <laughs> it looks like, yeah. But we still have to think about uh, case, use cases, right? Yeah, John. It, you connect at every send from SQL Server Master, yeah. <clears throat> but actually, like internally, it has access to different pools. That's why you can use some jobs to access HDFS, but it not goes through SQL Server Master. It goes through directly <clears throat> the storage pool. But if you use some web application, you will connect to master. And <clears throat> data virtualization in SQL Server 2018 and big data clusters, they are like common components. Some of them not available in big data cluster, like generic DBC. It's available only on Windows Server. Uh, but all big data cluster runs on Linux version of SQL Server. We have Cloudera, HDP, DLS, S3. So we can connect all these data sources we can connect to relational databases like Oracle, Teradata, SQL Server, and we can connect uh, to MongoDB and Cosmos DB, yeah, but Cosmos DB using MongoDB API. That's why we can connect <coughs> uh, and connect with everything like external tables and try to use it in Discover. Um, this like available data sources, I'm pretty sure Microsoft will increase number of data sources in the future, but actually like generic DBC should cover most of them, <laughs> right? 
uh, but it's not available for big data cluster. That's one point. <clears throat> uh, how we use like data virtualization itself? It's like polybase. It's just polybase, right? It's nothing new. Polybase, external tables, and if you already know how to use it, and it's pretty quick to create. And if you don't know, it's really easy to start to use it. It's just create table with a specified data source. Yeah. First of all, you create your credentials, data scope credentials for each your data source, like Oracle, Teradata, or Hadoop, right? And this is like username and password, some credentials. For external data sources, you specify like a protocol, Oracle, Hadoop, MongoDB, Teradata, or DBC, when you create external data source. And here you specify like SQL Server, Oracle, your address, push down, predicate. Uh, by default, it's on, but just to know that we have this parameter in external, create external table. Yeah, it allows you push down your predicates, your logic, like query folding to source system if it's possible. And as I said, by default, it's on. You can change it uh, on query level. Yes? Uh, how it, how does it work, or how do we configure it? How do we configure it? I mean, is it different? No. Each, each data source has a different Yeah, but uh, it's limited only by driver. Yeah. So uh, you don't have to configure it yourself. Just enable or disable. You can enable disable it on. Uh, data source level or on query lab level using hints, yeah. <clears throat> but there is no any additional configuration or like some instructions how you can tell source system that you should apply this, like this push down predicate or not, or there is no any configuration. It's just on, off, that's it. If uh, engine SQL Server optimizer can convert something to source system uh, predicates, it does. If not, so. But the possibility features what kind of uh, logic we can push down to our source system, it's limited only by driver. <coughs> Use it to access source system. <coughs> uh, where you specify your credentials yeah, to access. Next, it's create external table. An external table, you just create your structure, columns, data types, and you specify locations. For uh, SQL Server, it's like schema, <coughs> uh, <coughs> as database schema table. For uh, Oracle, this is listener uh, user table. So this is location where you access your table and data source that we create at external data source. Uh, create statistics, it's very important part. You have to create local statistics for SQL server that it knows data distribution and uh, your source system, right? It speed up queries. And next it's just execute query, right? So statistics, really important, uh, created for all tables, external tables, and for one, many, columns, what is more applicable, you can consult with uh, DBA who manage source system, what columns would be better for statistics about that. <coughs> this is one way, polybase. Yeah, when we talk about like relational databases and uh, some <coughs> how to base it, when we talk about uh, HDFS, local HDFS, like our storage pool, uh, we can use uh, two types, like local HDFS, 
the storage pool on our big data cluster, or we can use HDFS tiering. We, I will show you, i talk about it later. <coughs> Local HDFS is just HDFS. Tiring, this is, uh, we can connect to our local HDFS, external HDFS storages as a mount, as like folders. Yeah, it looks like a folder, but essentially this is our external HDFS storage. It allows us to have all in one tree our HDFS folders and we can work with this data as a local one. And to create it, uh, for local one. We have to use uh, this location, this predefined system location uh, that allows us to access our storage pool and big data cluster. And approach the same, like data source, our external data source, location, this folder where we store our data, our CSV, Parquet, or C files, right? And file format we had to create because on HDFS, we store files. Yeah, we have to tell SQL Server what kind of format we have. We have what delimiter, is it CSV file or a TSV file? Is it ORC or Parquet, right? <coughs> That's where we specify it. And for HDFS tiering, we have to mount this external HDFS. And for mount, we specify, we can do it using command line, or we can, uh, like from last uh, extension for big data cluster, Azure Data Studio, uh, we have a wizard to do that. But uh, you still can use command line AZ data tool to mount your external. Uh, yeah, for Azure Data Lake, like now, now it support to external data sources like Azure Data Lake Storage, uh, Gen2, and S3, AWS S3. Uh, for uh, where you specify your address and you specify your account key and secret key. And when you mount, you just specify this pass and where you would like to mount this one. It will create your external data source. <clears throat> Any questions? Oops. For S3, again, you on S3 you create your uh, access key and secret key, and you use access key, secret key here, and then you mount your S3. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you S3, because after yeah, I upgrade to RC1, uh, it's, it still stores, like cached somewhere, my old credential for S3, and now it doesn't apply my new credentials and I can't mount it. Uh, this known problem and Microsoft will uh, write some <coughs> work around how to clean this cache and they will fix it in next release. I think in uh, G, it's already in GA, so in GA it should be fixed. But I, I use the release candidate one. Okay, it's uh, like demo time. Okay. So my, <clears throat> as I said, when you connect to your big data cluster, it just does connect to any SQL server, yeah. Uh, you just need to specify your connection port, yeah, this 31, 4, 3, 3, and your address, server address, and it looks like your SQL server, except you have additional folder HDFS. HDFS, it's our local storage pool, and on this storage pool, I have mounted my Azure Data Lake storage. Yeah, this is folder on my Azure Data Lake storage. I can show you. Yeah, this is my folder Data Lake storage. Yeah, as you can see, it's the same structure here. 
And we will start with the simple way to create data visualization. It could be uh, your data analyst or data scientist if they have access, or even for IT support, it's easy to create this one. <coughs> for uh, in your, uh, you can go to manage your server. And here you have data visualization tab where you have external table wizard. Uh, so far, Visa support two data sources, SQL and Oracle. So just create, I have my Oracle database on virtual machine. Yeah. This uh, like free one. And I have several tables in HR schema. I will, I'm going to use inventory table. I have some data here. Right. <coughs> I already created uh, some credentials and data source that I will select this one, but you can create your new one, specify address. Here you specify your service name or listener name for Oracle for free version, this is XE. And credentials, I use my credentials uh, that I already created. And I have access to my instance. I can see my tables. Right. I can select my tables, see structures, and I can change well, what is my name for this table in my system, right? I can create an Oracle schema inventory uh, by wizard. It shows me, and here I can create from wizard or I can generate script and see how it looks like and modify something. <coughs> It creates my table, and I should see it in my aura. Yeah, I can see it here. As you can see, it like, looks like the same table in my database as the local one, just with external suffix, and I can see my data as well. Yes. Sure. Does this bring the data into the SIG server? If not, you can rely on the SIG Then how? What's the difference between main server and back? What's the traditional? Back. Like functionally, it's a different. Yeah. Like from uh, user perspective, it's the same. Yeah, LinkedIn server. But uh, first of all, we don't have LinkedIn server on Linux version and uh, linked server, this is a slow version of connection, external connection, yeah, it's using only DB. <coughs> Polybase use distributed, it's multi-threading, it's more the performance better for Polybase. <coughs> uh, yeah, and we have some data here. But you can uh, use uh, T-SQL to create, yeah. I have, this is my table, and I create credentials, like my SQL. I create database scope of credentials, username, password, and then you create your external table, yeah, as I show it in my slide, the same syntax, yeah. Uh, external table, can execute this one. Uh, yeah. See a data source. Sorry. I think. Just to show that 
it works. Mm. Special credentials. Sync. Mm -hmm. Code credentials. The same. Data source. So, so the change it credentials name. Let me come back to see what is the correct name. Using T-SQL, I <coughs> can create my table as well. And most important, it's create statistics for this table. And because this is, looks like the same table, what is like data utilization, we can combine Usually it's faster, it just may be like internet connection or usual like data studio. Because like I use it just wizard, it created it immediately, right? But there's no there's no transfer of data. No no. No no no. no. It just go to server, look to this location. Like find listener schema and table if this table exists, it just create it. And match my schema with metadata in my data source. Yeah. But you were creating statistics with Bootstrap, right? That was basically all the data, right? Uh, it's calm, yeah. yeah. It's, but I mean it doesn't move data, but it's pushed down this. Yeah. 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 It might take time to change. For big tables, yes. But my table is not really big. Oh, yes. Just follow up then by adding how 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 do you determine this is accurate? Uh, you don't know it. You have to like update it periodically <laughs> on a periodic basis because like there is no way to know what something changed in this table, right? When when we have great statistics on our local table, like the system knows that we change it like twenty percent of our data, we, we can automate it. Yeah. Auto update statistics. But there is no auto update statistics for external table. That's why we need to do like consult with our DBA on data source side and understand how frequently we change data and how much data we change on data source and then automate it here on our side. Yeah, no, no. You can't use it. <laughs> but for like maybe I don't know. I should ask Microsoft about it. <laughs> but I didn't ask them about like usually I use it to like do it myself as it was even for Azure SQL DW, right? It Update statistic wasn't available, and we implemented it ourselves. Mm, it doesn't matter because, like, it uses just internal drivers. Internal drivers doesn't know what kind of statistic how to automate it. It should be some triggered things on big data clusters that look to table, check statistics, and update it on this side. Yeah, but it should be something. You, create, you can like create it here 
like notebook and then automate this notebook. It will be check something and update statistics. But again, it's work around. You have to do it yourself. Yeah. Is there any sort of cap on the number of tasks? No. For tables, there is no question. <coughs> For uh, uh, tire HDFS, you have cache. It's about, uh, it will use data, like cache data on your HDFS for external HDFS sources, and, but you don't have like, any configuration how to check it, how to flush it. Uh, you have command line to like refresh. When you refresh, it's flush this cache and then update it. Uh, yes? Yes, you know, that, yeah, you have to create, not, like, not have to, but should create statistics uh, for external data that your local SQL Server optimizer knows something about your external data and can use it to push down predicates or something that you can consume some optimization things on your source, like index or other things. Yeah. Otherwise, my like, optimizer doesn't know how to push down something in optimal way. How to use, how to convert from SQL to Oracle using driver possibilities. It tells like it's like tricks <laughs> for optimizer. <clears throat> and statistics it's really important for any things. And. And when you have your external table, you can combine with local and discover data, analyze data. But you should be careful, again, because if you run without any filters and select a lot of data, you will increase workload in your source system. And uh, yeah, and you will go to blacklist for, of your DBA. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so is there a way to see what is getting pushed down? What kind of what the execution plan is? Uh, yeah, you can, it's exactly what I'm going to show <laughs> next. Uh, I have, like it's not possible to see in a, a notebook, but it's possible from SQL. Yeah, I have the same query and I can use explain, but, uh, like actually, it's not possible to see uh, from execution plan visual, yeah, what kind of query because here you have remote query, that's it. But it tells you that this external table it push some. So. <clears throat> but you can use the DMV uh, to see what kind of job, what kind of query you send to external source, and it look like in Oracle, yeah. Uh, you can look at an Oracle site as well, or source. <coughs> yeah. And something like this, my Oracle query. Oops, sorry. And I can see that it used some predicates, my conditions, like from one to 1,000 on SQL site. We can uh, <coughs> see it if we look to sorry, system information queries. Yes. And for example, longest queries, like exact distributed queries, and we can see like my query here. And like we can diagnose it in more Good. ways. Yes. So what are the limitations of SQL that you use? Like can we do checks or can we uh, you know, do it for instructions? And uh, no. Uh, like query store doesn't work for it. And you know, in, uh, you can't create the index because this is not real data. 
you can create statistics to take something for your optimizer. <clears throat> this is only because this is on only data, metadata. Yeah, on SQL Server side, you store only metadata. You don't have data itself. <clears throat> That's why. Uh, yeah, so this is like result. My cluster is pretty small, uh, so it, it took you know, one minute, more than one minute for me. <clears throat> So, this is how we work with relational databases. Well, it's the same for Teradata. If you use SQL Server 2019, you can use a DBC, generic or DBC, and approach the same. Like you create external tables, then you can use it to join. If you, uh, like your data scientist, data analyst, identified some data from external systems that you need. You can easily like, create simple like, ETL in T-SQL, just move this data to your internal big data cluster, to your data mart in big data cluster, and start using it, right? And run more complex analytics on it and modifications. <coughs> uh, about HDFS, how to, we can, uh, like what is important in big data cluster because uh, you have access not only to relational data sources but you have your data lake. Yeah, you have non-relational data and more storage for this data. And you can create the same uh, tables, external tables for your HDFS data. So we use the same approach but we need to create external files format. We need to tell SQL Server that files on HDFS has this structure, like file, field delimiters, string delimiters, uh, would like, do we have headers or not? Yeah, do we need to pass some number of first records? I think I already have this one file format, and that's why I just create my external table on my HDFS, I can specify or a specific file, but because this is my data lake, I can periodically like, store different data, not only in one file, but it could be partitioned by months, by years, and different folders. That's why uh, I specified only my root folder for this data. You have to change it, yeah. It can identify dynamically. No. <clears throat> that something change it. Yeah. Like, there, it's not, there is no magic, right? It's uh, the same as for ETL. Like in ETL logic, we usually implement like big piece of ETL. It's try to identify something changing in source and dynamically re-implement, like change schema <laughs> and etc. And here is the same. There is no magic, virtualization, like uh, rely on data sources if uh, your like, vendor for this OLTP database changes some structure and deploys this update, everything here crashed. You, you have to update it. <coughs> Uh, and my external successfully, web HDFS, web click stream HDFS, where's my table? Come on. Refresh. That's what I don't like in Data Studio. When you refresh, it just collapses everything. tables and it looks the same, right? And I still have my columns. After that, I can run my query that uses HDFS table 
and my local SQL table. <coughs> and it doesn't return me any. And it thinks, okay, let's try. Good that you can preview uh, files on HDFS in Data Studio. Oh. Okay, still something with connection. For this, go to extreme data CSV file. Mm -hmm. Nope. <laughs> it looks like something wrong with this file. Okay, I will show another one. Uh, Another way how to create for, uh, from CSV file, <coughs> we have built-in wizard for CSV files. I, mean, I just, okay. Since I need to restart my data studio, but I will not do it now. I will go. But I can assure you it works. <laughs> And what is important, some internal tables, system tables, or DMVs that you can use to monitor about it. Like knows how many external tables or data sources you have. Yeah, your external data sources and your tables. Identify like troubleshoot, long running queries, and here you will need more like education on how to troubleshoot distributed queries because it polybase use distributed environment to send query, optimize it. And this is, you can find a lot of information how to do it in Azure SQL DW or for SQL Server polybase, how to use DMVs and analyze this data. It's really a lot of information and scripts how to do that. Yeah. Each query has this ID that you can trace using this ID more detailed information about steps for each query. You can trace what it, like copy data, distribute data, broadcast data. <coughs> and you can find oops, some more detailed information which, uh, how much data it reads from data source or something like that. <coughs> right. okay. So it shows me I use Oracle, this query is the Oracle, this is my Oracle compatible query, how much data I read, and I can really identify and give some information to DBA and source system, try to troubleshoot. <coughs> Maybe I don't do the right predicate or outdated statistics or something, right. Uh, next one option, for HDFS tiring, as I showed you, I have my DLS. This 
showed already how you can mount this one. Uh, important information that like, when you use tiring, this is only read-only read operation. You can't write to your tiring HDFS. You can write on your local HDFS, but you can't write to data lake storage or S3. And it doesn't track changes. If you upload new information to your data lake storage, it big data cluster doesn't see it. You have to refresh <coughs> mount. After that, you can see this new data in your hierarchy here. <coughs> uh, external HDFS, you can connect blob storage, for example, as external HDFS. And in this case, you can write. It's not only, not only read mount, but it's also write, because now it uses polybase. Like tiring, it's the option of Hadoop, an external table is option of polybase, and polybase can work both sides, write and read. And it's important if you need, for example, uh, write to your local HDFS, some read data from table Oracle, and write to your local HDFS using ORC format, right? That's how you populate, like create ETL to push data to your data lake and then do some transformations or uh, using local Spark and machine learning for data scientists. And you can connect it. So. I think I already created, but I will check. Have it and then I just create my new data source external. I have it. I create my data format. For simplicity, I create my uh, file like a text file. And then I create my external table. <laughs> this is my structure for my CSV file. And I would like to store this data in my blob storage to WWI folder. So it means it will be a seed uh, yeah, here. So I already have some files, you can delete it. Oops. And now go back. Mm -hmm. And if I insert something, for example, one record. It will create files on my blob storage. Like here. Yep. So in this way I can, like because I just insert one record, but uh, I can do it, for example, in another example, I will show how to do it for local HDFS and we read data from Oracle. But this is approach how you can uh, write your ETL using uh, data virtualization, not only for read, but to write, read data from your source system, put data to your data lake, and like, build your data lake in more easy way than uh, create complex pipelines with different data sources. <coughs> and for exporting uh, to HDFS, you have to enable it, like flag, parameter, allow polybase export. Yeah, by default, it disable it, but you, that's why you change uh, this parameter and rec reconfigure. And after that, you can, uh, for example, I will create in my sales database, And 
now I will create file format ORC uh, here. Here I can use Parquet as well. And I specify compression. If I would like to use compression my table, <coughs> my data. And then I create my external table. My external table with this structure. Structure as my Oracle database. And here I specify my data source. Uh, this is my local HDFS and big data cluster, my folder inventory ORC. And we see this one is empty. And now oh, I created it. Right. And now I can just select data from my external Oracle table and insert to my this HDFS external table from one external table to another external table. <coughs> 1000 rows, I can check it. Select. Yeah, I have 1000 rows and I should have data here. <coughs> Yeah, I have my ORC file uh, with snap compression, snappy compression, and I can like, select it even I don't need to create another external table, so it's already created, so I just select it and join with any tables. So uh, I can create my external tables to relational databases, I can create external tables to my data lake, and like integrated in one place in one database like SQL, right? And in this way, I allow my uh, data scientist, my data analyst, just accessing to my relational database and play with this data, like external, internal, my data warehouse in big data cluster, my data lake data, and my business available data. And my data scientist can use this data from notebook and Python and do something with this as well. Uh, my business people can uh, no, let's change it. I'd like to show you. I have Power BI workbook connected to my database, and so business can use my BI tools to connect and write reports, but it's no, I would not recommend to do that because business people would like to play with data and put a lot of numbers and different parameters and filters, and it will kill our source system. So that's why not, it's better to do for analysts, yeah, analysts or they, they can they understand what they do, yeah. How do they write these queries? <coughs> they will use it carefully. And uh, this is another one. That's why we it's time to talk about best practices. And best practices. pretty simple and there are a few of them. First of all, you should know your consumers, right? You should know is it business people, is it data analyst, is it data scientist? Yeah, because all, all of them use different use cases and different approaches how to use data. Top managers or managers, they need just numbers and this is why you can just provide them created reports that use this virtualized data sources. They can see fresh data, but they can't change a lot in this report and filter it using different parameters. Yeah. Analysts and data scientists, they need more flexibility. 
Yeah, for them it's more appropriate because they would like to play with many data sources and discover this data. That's why you should first of all identify those groups of consumers, identify use cases for them, and then start to think how to build what, what data to connect to your data database as external tables and how to provide access to this data. Uh, you should know your source system and write queries considering source system. Is it Oracle? Is it MySQL? Or uh, do we have indexes? You should consult with DBA what kind of optimization we have on source data source database and use it when you create views on top of it, for example, and consult your analyst and data scientists how to use it. <coughs> Push predicates and query folding. Like big data cluster, Polybase can do query folding. It uses driver to convert from T-SQL to Oracle or MySQL language. But you should, it's like not all construction should, could be pushed. That's why you need to check, like monitor, create some views using DMV and check more like uh, slow, slow queries and try to figure out why it's slow. Maybe somebody doesn't use filter or it's because driver can't convert in the optimal way to Oracle syntax, you have to figure out it. Yeah, uh, but it's really important by default, that's why by default it's on, uh, but if you don't need it, uh, but I, I don't know any cases that it, it would somehow affect your source system or it's forbidden to use on source system. That's why I always use push down predicates. And cache, yeah. Uh, for big data cluster, it's not appropriate for external tables on a relational database because there is no cache. But uh, I just put it here because if you have if you use some data virtualization platform, another from big data cluster or polybase like Dinodo, yeah, or we they have cache, they have uh, some configuration for this cache, how frequently update this cache or Dreamio, yeah, uh, they have this parameter how frequently update cache. It's very important and it affects your uh, managers or analysts because they rely on fresh data but you update it every day for example they need more frequently update <coughs> maybe in uh, in future big data cluster will have cache as well that's why it's better to keep in mind this information about uh, and summary like for giveaway that data virtualization, it's tricky. Uh, it's not easy like that. Yeah, it's not just configuring and give everyone access to this. <clears throat> but it's easy to start using it. Yeah, try, uh, learn how people start using it, optimize, roll back, and try again. But first of all, you have to learn your use cases, your audience, your consumers. And Big Data Cluster provides you easy way to create it. Yeah, uh, not only for relational sources, but not relational HDFS data lake because data lake became more and more popular, right? <coughs> and uh, just using T-SQL, you can create any virtualization item, yeah, entity. Please, uh, evaluation field evaluation form for conference for sessions because it's really important to improve conference and session itself for speakers. Uh, please don't forget to do that. And you can win some prizes for this as well <laughs> tomorrow. This is my contacts. Thank you everyone. Uh, have a good evening. I, I think there are many uh, sponsor, sponsored uh, parties today. Yeah. If you are going, thank you. <laughs> yeah.